Welcome to this new episode of our mini podcast. Today we're interviewing Frank de Vin, who is a Belgian astronaut and has been twice to the ISS. And we'll learn a little bit about his experience in space in today's interview. Welcome to the interview, Frank. Thank you very much. Yeah. To open today's talk, I would like to ask you how the dream of becoming an astronaut was born, if there was a precise moment uh, where you realized, or if this was a gradual well, I think it was more kind of a, a gradual uh, endeavor. Uh, I always wanted to become an engineer when I was young and, and work things and, and, and build things. Uh, and then I also had the opportunity to fly uh, with a family member uh, yeah. on a helicopter. And I also wanted to become a pilot. So I, I started studying to become a pilot engineer. And then at a certain moment, uh, the space shuttle flew for the first time. Uh, I was uh, at that moment in university and I thought, hmm, well, maybe that's something that I would like to do later as well. So it's kind of stayed in the back of my mind. I think it was in 89, uh, European Space Agency uh, launched an announcement that they would like to recruit new astronauts. So I applied like uh, many have done as well in the 2022 yeah. selection. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. There were more than 20,000 applicants. At that time, there were not so many yet. But I applied and then I was selected as that's, an astronaut. That's great. Yeah. Let's talk about the astronaut training. Which element do you think really uh, proved to be uh, difficult? Well, for me, as an, uh, as an engineer and a scientist, uh, of course, the most difficult part for me was to learn Russian. Hmm. Yes. Uh, that is uh, very clear. I, uh, I always had very bad results uh, when I was in school on, on French and on English and on, on languages. The so languages. This was not, not my strong point, so, but you have to learn it uh, to okay. fly to the International Space Station, as well, especially on the Soyuz here. Mm. Right? I was the, the board engineer number one, okay. uh, which means that you're basically responsible for uh, operating all the systems on board of the, of the Soyuz. Uh, all the documentation, all the commands from the ground are all in Russian, so you okay. have to have a, a very good knowledge of the, of the Russian language. So that was for me the, the most difficult uh, one. Uh, the rest, okay, as a fighter pilot, uh, when you uh, learn to operate complex uh, yeah, yeah. aircraft or spacecraft, uh, more or it uh, is much the same. And then as a scientist, of course, you're more an operator on board of the space station. You need, of course, to follow the procedures very accurately. Yeah. Uh, you need to understand a little bit about the science, but of course, you're not the scientists themselves that really go into mm -hmm. the, the deep science uh, knowledge that they need to have. That's, that's amazing. Yeah, sounds really difficult uh, to get this all uh, together. So you flew in 2002 mm -hmm. on uh, TMA-1, am I yes. correct? Yes. Yeah. And how did it feel when uh, you knew you were going to fly? Well, it was, of course, uh, very thrilling eh, that, uh, that you know that finally you are selected and uh, you're, you're chosen to, to fly on a mission. At the end, of course, you only fly when you sit in the rocket and the rocket yeah. leaves. Yeah? That's, that's clear. So there is still a lot of preparation uh, to go. It was also a very interesting mission because basically we flew on two different spacecraft. Uh, we flew up with the Soyuz TMA-1, which was okay. a, a modernized Soyuz version. But we came back with the, the Soyuz TM, which was the last version of an analog Previous, uh, so, uh, Soyuz that, uh, that still flew with uh, all analog screens okay. and analog yeah, buttons. Yeah. Uh, so we had to do all the exams twice as well. Once twice? For, once for the new Soyuz and once <laughs> for the old Soyuz. So it was a very interesting mission. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That sounds uh, really like a, a double challenge uh, where you have to prepare for both. So you were a flight engineer in the first mm -hmm. mission. Now looking at this uh, model of the Soyuz, yeah. Um, we can see it's uh, not a very large spacecraft. Uh, there's barely space for three passengers. Mm -hmm. And what was your responsibility during the flight as an engineer? What were you looking uh, after of parameters maybe? So as a flight engineer, uh, you're basically operating the spacecraft. Yeah? The yeah. commander is there to, to command, yeah. to oversee the flight, to oversee the mission. Uh, and to make sure that everything is happening as it should be yep. uh, and that the, the flight engineer, the number one, uh, is executing the procedures as okay. he should be. Yeah. Yeah, it's an usual role in what we call uh, crew management, yeah? that you have one person that can sit back and that can look at uh, a number of things yeah. and then you have uh, a person that executes and then you have also 
two levels of control because mm, if you mm. would both do exactly the same task then you don't control each other anymore okay. and that's never very good and you need to, to make sure that uh, one can uh, control of course it's, it's not really controlling in the thing but yeah, it's yeah, a, yeah. to verify to have a second pair of eyes as we call uh, right. on what you're doing so basically my job was to command all the space uh, all the systems of the Soyuz and yeah. to execute all the procedures so you flew on the rockets and then the Soyuz arrives on the ISS how many hours of journey is it from the takeoff to the docking it's itself? a little bit different now in my time we still had uh, uh, two days rendezvous yeah. uh, so it took about 48 hours to arrive at uh, okay. the space station uh, today they do a four or six hours uh, rendezvous uh, which is much faster of course but yeah. uh, this uh, is only possible because today indeed they have uh, uh, more advanced systems, digital systems uh, on board of the Soyuz. It also has a drawback in, in our time. You could basically launch every day to the space station mm -hmm. with this two or six hours rendezvous. Uh, you have less launch windows. It's only uh, every other day or two days out of yeah. three that you basically can launch. And this is because of the inclination that has to match your launch site, I assume. Uh, absolutely. It's orbital mechanics. So you always mm. have to launch in the plane yeah. uh, where the ISS is. And of course, if you want to catch up with the ISS, yeah. you basically have to launch almost when the ISS is overhead yeah. of, the, of the launch site. Makes sense. Uh, when, uh, when you have two days to, to catch up with the ISS, the ISS can be in the same plane, but on the other side of the world, for example. It doesn't matter so much yeah, yeah, because yeah. you have all the time to catch up uh, during the two days that you're Okay, flying. okay. I think that makes sense. You have a lot more uh, time to maneuver and adjust once yeah. you're in your final uh, initial orbit. Uh, that is amazing. When you were on your first flight, as I understand it was a bit shorter on the ISS, your first day? Yeah, the, the first flight was about uh, 10 days because we basically changed out uh, the vehicle. Uh, we came up with the Soyuz TMA, which was a brand new vehicle. And we came down with the Soyuz TM yeah. uh, because the Soyuz was there at that time uh, for crew rescue. Uh, the, the rotations were still done by uh, the shuttle uh, okay. that were doing the, the yeah. crew rotations, not, uh, not the Soyuz uh, crew. Um, so that's why uh, it was 10 days and we changed out from one Soyuz to the other. Okay, okay. And I understand you ran some experiments on your first flight on the ISS. Is there any moment that you, you carry with, uh, that you consider memorable, maybe? There's always moments that you consider uh, memorable, but I, I think uh, uh, operating and working in the mm. microgravity science glove box, uh, which is, uh, by the way, here oh, in, uh, okay. in our module as well. Uh, and one of the experiments from my first flight is there as well. Uh, uh, promise experiment uh, was, of course, uh, great to, to work in this uh, brand new equipment because yeah. everything was brand new at the time. Uh, the, the space station just started at that time. 2002, so it was around uh, three years since mm. uh, the start. That's, yeah, that's very new. <laughs> And uh, in your second flight, in 2009, you stayed much longer, right? The second flight was a long duration space flight, uh, like uh, all our astronauts now do six months on board of the, the International Space Station. Uh, <clears throat> there, of course, it's, uh, it's very different uh, because, okay, you, you don't know exactly every single day how it will be planned. Okay. Uh, the the yeah. planning is, uh, is more fluent uh, there uh, or, or can change, while for the short duration space flight, of course, you know your schedule from the first day mm -hmm the last day exactly and you know exactly what you're going to do when for the entire flight. So it's pre-planned and in this case um, it's a bit more uncertain because it's so long. Yeah, it's time. so long yeah. they can of course not plan everything yeah. six months in advance. Uh, usually mm -hmm. the schedules are made uh, one to two weeks in advance yeah. uh, but for these short missions where you have uh, a high intensity of workload for a short duration in time mm -hmm. Uh, it's of course much more intense and, and you can do that because it's 10 days, uh, 10, 10 days, days you can uh, you can survive. Yeah, you yeah. cannot work at that same pace and the same intensity for yeah. six months. It's six impossible. months, uh, yeah, yeah. And uh, correct me if I'm wrong, you were the first European commander of the ISS in uh, your second flight. That, that's true uh, at that time as well. Up till then we only had uh, Russians and uh, mm. American commanders of the space station. So uh, I paved a little bit the way for uh, also the other international partners. Like uh, Japan and, uh, and Canada, but also for all our uh, astronauts from the 2009 class uh, that yeah. have done the second flight and that uh, also have been able to become commanders. It's uh, really inspiring for us Europeans. Uh, were there any aspects of uh, leadership in a space station, but with so few people, that you think were completely different to what you've 
uh, experienced before. Le leadership is not completely different. It, uh, it's uh, always, for, for me at least, uh, leadership uh, goes uh, around three, three axes. It's uh, leadership by example. Yeah? Yep. If you want to be a leader and you want to, to have people to have a certain attitude, a certain work ethic to, to, to do your work in a certain way, you have to, to give the example. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that is uh, very clear for me. It's leadership by motivation. Uh, you don't want uh, to have to tell people now you have to do this. You want to motivate people so that yeah. they are self-inspired to do the job that they have to do. And it's leadership by consensus building. Uh, again, uh, it's very easy as a boss to take decisions. Yeah? Mm -hmm. uh, we can take decisions in, in every second that we want. I can now decide that I stand up and I walk away. Yeah. It's a decision. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, that's very easy to do. Finding a solution is much more difficult okay. sometimes. Yeah? It's a compromise. And that's, and that's what I'm meaning by leadership, by con consensus. You have, you have a problem and then you work with your team to say, well, okay, how are we going to solve this? There are different pathways. Mm -hmm. How do you reach a consensus to go to the, to the best pathway? And then, of course, as the boss, you need to take the final decision. That is very clear. Yeah. But you first try to find the best uh, possible way and to find a solution. And, and I find that this works in any environment, uh, be it the military, be it here in, uh, at ESC, be it in, in a space environment and also on board of the International Space Station. But of course, there are specificities if you are in a military environment, uh, like I was in my first part of my career. Okay, it's a very homogeneous group of mm. people, so you can maybe much quicker arrive to a solution. Yeah. While, uh, of course, on board of the International Space Station in a multi natural environment with very mm. different cultures, with people that do not speak the same language. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, of course, it, it takes more time and you have to then much more take into account the cultural aspects, I, I would say, of anybody of your team members. Yeah, it must be quite different. Uh, much, much more layers to consider. There are more layers to consider. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's, uh, that's amazing, uh, really interesting uh, compared to Earth. Now, between living in space and living on Earth, which one did you prefer? Because I've heard people like Samantha say that they prefer life in zero G. What is your take on this? I think life in zero G, it depends what you mean. Uh, uh, of course, in zero G, you're always at your ease. You're always uh, in equilibrium. Uh, you, can, you can move much easier than uh, here on Earth. Uh, so that's, uh, but real life is here on Earth. Your family is here, your kids are here. Uh, uh, nature is here, you can go for a walk, it's difficult to go for a walk uh, when yeah, you're yeah. in the International Space Station. <laughs> so, uh, of course, uh, I prefer very much uh, the life here on Earth, but uh, the life on the Space Station, of course, for a temporary time is, mm. is great as well. Okay, okay. And uh, one final question of the flight experience. Uh, how does it feel when you land back on Earth and they open the hatch of the module? Because mm. this is the only section mm. that remains after the re-entry. How, did you feel anything uh, that you did not expect to feel when you saw the blue sky again? Well, it's not seeing so much the blue sky and on, on both cases, uh, the first uh, landing it was night, the second case it ah. was completely uh, foggy and cloudy. Uh, but uh, on both cases, what you, what you really feel is the, the fresh air coming in because for uh, six months you, you have only been uh, breathing stale air, yeah, like you have in your uh, bedroom when the door is closed for a long time. So uh, uh, having fresh air and cool air uh, for the first time uh, really was something that uh, on, on both occasions uh, struck me. Yeah, yeah, that's amazing. That's amazing. What does space mean to you? Space means for me uh, science, knowledge means the future. Uh, it means that uh, inspiration for young people. Uh, mm -hmm. So that's also why we have our European space exploration program for uh, for these aspects. Huh? We we create new knowledge uh, here on Earth with our scientists. Uh, we innovate uh, certain systems. We work in international cooperation, and we inspire young people. That's the most important part uh, for me for space. I agree. That's amazing. Thank you so much. Now I, we have a simulation here mm -hmm. with uh, a little software called the Carval Space Program. Basically, I recreated a simulation of the Soyuz flight mm -hmm. and a simulation of the docking of the Soyuz orbital uh, module with the ISS. Here we're going to look at the launch sequence of the mm -hmm. Soyuz. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is a video game that reconstructs the orbital mechanics involved. So I'm going to start the auto, uh, the ascent guidance. 
we're going to engage the autopilot with an ascent profile. It's a bit loud. And this is the Soyuz recreated in its um, highest authenticity, mm -hmm. so to speak. We have some green aliens. They are the Kerbals that you can see on my shirt. Uh, okay. Maybe you've seen them. And right now, this Soyuz is taking them into orbit. And it will go through exactly the same sequence mm -hmm. uh, that you relived. So for example, we're going to have the Korolev cross when the boosters separate. Mm -hmm. Now when this happened, did you feel a difference with the acceleration? Yeah, Do you remember absolutely. that? Yeah, absolutely. And so what you feel in the, in the Soyuz rocket, uh, you, you start with a very low acceleration and then it builds up. Okay. And of course, the moment that the, the boosters uh, uh, stop functioning and then get disconnected, of course, you, you have a, a significant drop in acceleration. Yeah, yeah. But you still have some acceleration because, of course, the main engine uh, still keeps working. Where you have the biggest shock, yeah, here it happens, mm -hmm. where you have the biggest shock is, of course, between the second and the third stage. Yep. Because there, of course, the, the second stage stops functioning. Right. You disconnect, so you go to zero gravity all of a sudden. Mm, uh, yeah, yeah. And then so you really have the impression that you or propelled forward uh, from your seat uh, and then immediately after the, the third stage ignites and then you're very quickly back in your seat because of course the, the vehicle then is much lighter yep. uh, and uh, you immediately have the ignition of the third stage so that you immediately go back to you go back to, to, uh, two and a half to three G's so it's not a very slow build up it's, it's a very it's abrupt an instant kick uh, it's an instant kick going from uh, almost four G's yeah, to yeah, zero yeah. To, uh, back to four G's so it's a uh, it's quite uh, interesting. So uh, the upper stage uh, was quite uh, brutal <laughs> in acceleration. Now, here we are almost in orbit. Eh? We are climbing through space. And finally here, we can reach. Um, we can open all of our aerodynamic fairing. We can accelerate with our upper stage. And this is the one you were referring to as mm -hmm. the one which accelerated to three, four yeah, Gs. Yeah, yeah. And how long does it take uh, for... Well, in, in total, the, hmm. the to orbit takes about eight minutes. And after eight minutes, you're in microgravity. Okay, yeah. that is brilliant. So in these few seconds left, I'm going to show you then what I did with the ISS here. Because this is a really um, customizable game. Mm -hmm. And you can reconstruct uh, every moving mechanism of the ISS. And I just want to show you uh, the docking sequence that we have between the Soyuz and the ISS. Now, did you train with docking uh, in case of emergency? Yes, yeah. uh, as a board engineer as well, you need to be qualified to, to manually okay. dock the international, to the International Space Station. And uh, what kind of controls did you use? Was it like a joystick setup? It, uh, well, the, the standard uh, uh, controls that you have in the Soyuz mm -hmm. are on the left hand side you have basically the translational okay. controls which is yeah. indeed a type of uh, three-dimensional uh, joystick and on the right hand side you have also your rotational uh, controls mm -hmm. which is a two-dimensional joystick then with a small rotator uh, on top that uh, okay. makes okay. you uh, that has the yaw uh, function it's been an honor and uh, your story is really amazing to hear so thank you very much thank you very and much enjoy uh, your uh, weekend frank and, uh, good luck with uh, all your podcasts uh, <laughs> in the future yes thank you very much uh, have thank a good weekend ciao. thank you ciao <laughs> ciao <laughs>